So in section 4.4, I'm gonna teach you how to count. Now, I know that's kind of funny to hear because you're in college and most of you probably feel like you already know how to count, which is cool. But what we're gonna count is the number of ways that something can happen. And how many ways something can happen is gonna really depend on a lot of the circumstances around that event. So let's start by looking at our multiplication rule. So multiplication rule says if you have a sequence of events, the first one can occur n ways or n one ways, the second one can occur n two ways, n three ways and so on. The number of possible outcomes from this series or sequence of events is the product of those numbers. So let's, let's demonstrate this with a pretty small example. And that is we're gonna take a coin and toss it and we're gonna roll one die. Now this isn't one of your Dungeons and Dragons dice like the dodecahedron or the icosahedron. It's just simply a cube. So in terms of possibilities, how many possibilities are there when we flip a coin? Two. Two. And how many possibilities are there when we roll a regular die? Six. 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 So we should get 12 possible outcomes. Now this is such a small example that we can do a little tea, uh, tree diagram to, to see all these possible outcomes. So no, what's up with my pens here? All right, third time's a charm. All right, so uh, we can start out and we can roll our toss of heads or we could toss a tails. And depending if we toss a heads or a tails, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna roll a die and you can roll a one, a two, three, four, five or six. And then same thing down here with the tails. A one, two, three, four, five, six. And this is called a, t, a tree diagram for hopefully obvious reasons. Kind of looks like all these possibilities are falling in on a tree. And so in total, what happens is that you could have H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, or T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, and T6. So that's your sample space. This is all the things that can happen with this experiment. So let's label it as such, our sample space. But if you look and did some counting, how many items are there in our sample space? 12, which is exactly what we predicted. There's gonna be 12 items in your sample space. Now, let's use this idea of multiplication to try and find some other things, some other total number of possibilities here. And we're gonna apply that first to uh, choosing some passwords. So uh, that'd be this one right here. Let's suppose that for a certain website that your password is gonna be five characters long. The first character must be a letter and the last four have to be digits. So let's figure out how many different possible password combinations there are in this restrictive kind of manner. So passwords. The first one is a letter and the next four are numbers. So how many choices do I have for that first one? 26. 
26. Now with our numbers, you can reuse them. I have 10 possibilities here, and then the same 10 here, and 10, and 10. All together, that'd be 260,000 possible password combinations for this kind of restrictive password. But suppose that somebody comes along and they're a little bit more conscientious about security and they said, you know what, let's open this up. So we're gonna do kind of a part B to this. And that is, uh, suppose each character is allowed to be a number or letter. So now you can use either one. And of course you can use repeats. You're not depleting your supply just because you use it once. You can use it again and again and again. How many choices are there for this first one? 36. 36. And then 36, and then 36, and then 36, and well, kind of repetitive there. Now on your calculator, I really hope that you're not gonna multiply 36 by itself five times. What's the faster way to do this? 36 to the fifth power. 36 to the fifth power, perfect. So 36 to the fifth power. You think that's gonna change the number of possibilities by a little bit? A lot of bit. <laughs> a lot of bit, yeah. That's probably a better way to say it because now all of a sudden you've got 60 million 466,176 possibilities. Wow. So, and if you added upper and lower case, that'd be even more, or special characters, even more. You can make this really, really big. The problem is most people don't. I had a friend of mine that worked for the IRS, and every now and then they'd have to break into somebody's files uh, that were hiding something, and they'd be encrypted. But all too often, they choose simple things like the kid's name and the kid's birthday, stuff like that. So if you want some security in your passwords, then you know, choose some special characters. Choose uppercase and lowercase. Uh, choose some numbers. But the more variety you put into this, the bigger you're going to make this number, and the less likely it is that somebody's going to be able to get at it uh, unless you want them to. So. Just a little bit of word of advice there. Okay, so that's, that's one means of counting here for us, is that when you have a series of events and you wanna figure out how many possibilities there are all together. But there's more different ways you can count things. Let's look at the next one. And the next one I prefer doing in class, but I don't have that luxury now which is really, really a shame. But we'll just have to use our imagination. And imagine that I'm looking out over my desk and I've got four of you in a row. And I ask the question, well, how many ways are there to line up four people? So, or how many ways are there can I arrange those four people? And let's just think about it before I cut to the, um, Cut to the handout. You have four choices for that first seat. And then after that, you'd have three choices left, and then two choices. And with the last seat, you really wouldn't have a choice. Now, I'm not interested so much in the fact that this number is 24 when you multiply it out. I'm interested in the notation. And mathematically, the notation is this. Now, if this were an English class, do you know what this would be read as? Four. All right. I wonder if I scared somebody in that. In any case, that's why I like doing this face to face. I definitely get more of a reaction. But in a math class, it's called four factorial four factorial. And four factorial is the number of ways you can arrange a group of n objects. And more generally, you're gonna have n factorial, which is the number of ways
to arrange a group of n objects. And that should be on your sheet uh, for counting rules. Should be like the second one down, factorial symbol. So there you go, you got four factorial like that. Now, oddly enough, you've got zero factorial is one, which is kind of bizarre. But there's a, there's a good mathematical reason for that. Uh, there's a definition of the factorial that's a little bit more general than we can deal with that actually shows that zero factorial is one. If you want that demonstration, take calc two for me. If not, then just take my word. Uh, n factorial is the number of ways to arrange n objects of ways to arrange a collection of n objects. Now the thing about factorial is that it grows really big, really fast. And so I'm gonna show you a couple different ways that we can, um, oops, I'm gonna show you a couple different ways that we can calculate factorials depending on what technology you have convenient to you. Um, but let's, let's do it in the context of a problem. So we'll go back to these problems here and we'll skip down to um, this one. A moving company is a truck filled for deliveries to nine different sites. If the order of the deliveries is randomly selected, what's the probability that the shortest route is taken? So, okay. Hmm. So let's look at this one. And I don't know, just maybe for giggles, I'll call this example D, just to kind of keep track of things. So example D. We wanna look at the probability of the shortest route. And you're gonna run into a lot of problems like this in the homework where you have to find the probability of something. Now, one thing I wanna point out is of all the routes that there are, how many of them are gonna be the shortest? One. One. There's just gonna be one out of all those routes that are gonna be the shortest. Now the question is, if you have nine spots to visit, how many different orders can you visit them in? In other words, how many ways can you arrange a collection of nine stops? Nine times. Mm, factorial. Oh, nine factorial. Nine factorial. And the amazing thing is just how big this gets. Now we'll do an over under game. Just throw out a number to yourself in your head. And I want you to see if, if the number that we get nine factorial is bigger or smaller than the number that uh, you're thinking. And you know, tell me what that number is. I'm just kind of curious if the size of nine factorial is a surprise in any way. So let me do this on this graphing calculator here. And I'll clear that out there. So if you want nine factorial, the first thing we're gonna do is type in the nine, and then we're gonna go find the factorial. And one way to find it is under the math menu. So I'll hit the math button, and I wanna go over to probability. So you can hit the right arrow three times or the left arrow two times. I always go to the left arrow. Is there something here on this menu that looks promising? Number four, factorial. Fourth option, factorial, there it is. So here we go. 362,880 different ways you can arrange those nine routes. So, wow, 362, 880. Did that surprise anyone with how big that is? Yes. All right, well, that's good. To me, it always is, is shocking how fast these numbers grow. 
So that means if you took the starting rotation for a baseball team, line them up from home plate to first base to stand in attention for the national anthem, that there'd be over 362,000 ways that you could put them in order. Wow. It'd take you quite a while to run through all those different orders. That's weird that it doesn't even seem realistic. It's, it's just really big, really fast. And the good news for us is that we've got these things like a graphing calculator to calculate that because what you don't want to have to do is do nine times eight times seven times six times five, you know, all the way down to one. That'd be a real pain. Now, for those of you who don't happen to have the convenience of a graphing calculator, there's some other technology we use in this class. Does anyone remember what it is? Google, Google Sheets. Sheet. Yeah, Google Sheets. So let me come up here and do the same thing for Google Sheets. Now, if you've never used Google Sheets before or if you haven't used it much, then a lot of times when you start typing in a command and you don't know what to type in, just type in a few letters. Like, let's see, I want a factorial, F-A-C-O-T. And it gives me a factorial. Now, of the two things here, one of them that's highlighted is the factorial of a number. If I hit the enter key, it gives me a left parenthesis. I'll type in the number I want the factorial of, that's a nine and then hit enter. There you go, 362,880. Pretty cool, pretty big too. Mm. How are we looking on that one? Doing okay? Pretty good. These are my favorite so far. All right, you know, I, I gotta be honest, what got me into math and then statistics uh, was this course in probability that I took from a guy named Carl Simon, the University of Michigan. He was fantastic. And these counting rules were really cool. I'm like, wow, this is kind of cool. So let's do some more here. We're going to add a little bit more to um, our ability to calculate and count things. And um, uh, actually, you know what? Um, let me educate you a little bit more here. I remember seeing a, um, a little list of the 72 best breweries in the United States. And the question was, well, if you wanted to visit these 72, what's the shortest route? So this is another kind of factorial problem. It's, um, it's kind of like a traveling salesman problem is what they call it. You have to decide which order to visit these things. But this is the problem. 72 factorial is too big for your calculator. If you tried 72 factorial, it's gonna give you an overflow. So let's take a look there. Um, probability, four, and it's too big. Wow, <laughs> what's going on with that? Well. Um, let me show you. And we can do it on Google Sheets. So let's do equals factorial 72, uh, not 720, 72. Bam, there you go. Now it's 6.12 times, well, in the E plus 103. Does anyone know what that means? Is that 103 more zeros? Yeah, it means times 10 to the 103rd power. Wow, that's really big. So basically, that's bigger than your favorite search engine. Um, 10, I'll see, equals 10 raised to the 100 power. This actually is a number that has a name. And you guys are familiar with this name, but with a different spelling. The spelling on this one is G O O G O L, a Google. Does anyone recognize the name a little bit? Kind of your favorite search engine? Yeah. So it's a one followed by a hundred zeros. And the idea 
with the founders of Google is that you could search for a Google amount of things on Google. So this number is actually bigger than a Google. It's huge. So, okay. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit more about some other things you can find with these kinds of calculations. And the next thing I'm gonna move down to is permutations. So a permutation is when you have R, uh, or excuse me, N objects, and you need to select R of them. But the order that you select those R objects makes a difference. So it's not just enough that, that you have the cards in your hand, you have to select them in the order, uh, a specific order. So I'm just gonna write down this much, permutations. Uh, permutations, and I'm gonna write order matters. and underline this. Now what I'm doing moving forward is that when I cover something, I'm really gonna try and emphasize what's important and what you should know for an exam. And this is important. You have to know that when you're dealing with a permutation that the order matters. Now the formula for this is NPR. So National Public Radio, NPR. And the way you calculate it is n factorial over n minus r factorial. Now, you don't necessarily need to know that formula. I mean, if you really needed it, I guess I would give it to you. What you do need to know is how to calculate that. So let's see an example of where you would calculate this. And that'd be another one from your handout. So, um, that'd be this one down here. So with a short time remaining in the day, the delivery driver has time to make four deliveries at four locations amongst the nine locations remaining. How many different routes are possible? Well, clearly the order that you choose things makes a difference. So, that's why we're gonna use permutations here as opposed to something else. So you've got nine possibilities and you're only gonna choose four of them. And let's see what that calculation is gonna look like. So it's gonna be nine P four. Okay, so it's gonna be nine factorial divided by nine minus four factorial. Now you could calculate it as nine factorial over five factorial, and there's nothing wrong with that, but even that feels like too much work for you. So again, let me show you how to do this on your calculator and then on Google Sheets. And then I'll also show you how to do it by hand. We'll go back and confirm our results here. But on the graphing calculator first, let me clear this. And I'm gonna type in the nine. And then I wanna to go to that probability menu. Do you remember where that probability menu was? Under math. Under math. Probability. To probability. And does it look like there's anything here that's helpful? Number four. Um, what else? Yeah, okay. let's go to number two. And that puts you in this notation, and then I got to fill in a four. And wow, you should be able to get 3,024 out of this. So, yay. And I'll go back in a minute and show you how to do this on Google Sheets. But another way you could think of this is the numerator you can think of as being nine times eight times seven times six times five. Well, wait, I'm gonna stop right here. Times five factorial. Can you suggest a reason why I would wanna stop at five factorial? Because I can cancel both of those. 
And now I'm just left with nine times eight times seven times six. Let's see what that is on a uh, calculator. Oh, 3,024, same thing. Now, are you gonna have to calculate like that? Like that? No. I want you to use technology. I don't want you to spend time messing around with something like this. How do you um, uh, how do you do this on Google Sheets now? Good question. Let's go over to Google Sheets, and I can get rid of that. Um, this. Let's type in equals, which is how we start out all our commands. And let's see, what do we want to do? We want to do a permutation. So you start typing in perm, you see all these things that it could be permutation. Now you can help me out there at home for a second. I've been typing this command for quite a while. It knows that I know this command. But for some of you that are new here, are you seeing a little bit more detail as to how this command is executed? So if you are, great. If not, great. Um, but if you don't know how to use a command, there's this cool thing you can do that we just discussed just a minute ago. You can Google it. And if you Google it, um, the first link will take you to this page. For your permutations, you enter the bigger number first, that is the size of the pool of objects to choose from, and then the smaller number second number that you're choosing from that uh, collection of n objects. So let me go back here. It's going to be permutation of 9 comma 4. Okay, so 3,024. Hmm. Hey, Professor. Yes. Where do you get that um, scientific calculator app? Is, did that come with your calculator? Oh, um, no, no, I, um, I had to get that from Texas Instrument. Um, try and think. I can try and see if there's a link available. I think at the start of COVID, they, um, <clears throat> they made this available to students on a temporary basis, and I can okay. check in to see if that's still available. Um, so yeah, uh, just a quick FYI though, what probably is available is, and this will shock you, there's an app for that for your phone. I'm pretty sure that the app is free. So, okay. uh, so that'd be another workaround if you wanted to have that. Um, but I'll see if they still have a link for this. I guess the nice thing about this uh, from my standpoint of view anyways, is it shows you the keystrokes so that if you're following along, you're like, well, what do you press? And you can look back and say, oh, okay. So nine math, left twice, four. Oh, yeah, that's a permutation. You know, nine objects taking out four of them. Enter. Cool. So I like that. I don't know as though that really is a selling point for you guys, but it's, it's nice to have. It helps to see kind of where you may have went wrong too, so it's cool. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a nice app, and like I said, I think they have that one for the phone as well. Now the big thing here that I emphasize was that order matters. What if order doesn't matter? Then you're dealing with a combination instead of a permutation. You're dealing with a combination, and the big thing here is that order doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter. And I can't scream that loud enough. All right, order doesn't matter. It might help if I spelled right. Order doesn't matter. I'm sorry, I kind of squeezed that in a little bit. Now, if order doesn't matter, then that's NCR. So and CR is calculated like this, N factorial, N minus R factorial 
But in addition to that, we've got another R factorial here. So this is, if you select R objects from a group of N objects, when the order doesn't matter. So the number of ways to select R objects from N objects when order doesn't matter. And let's do a couple fun ones. I think Jess was enjoying this earlier. And let me continue the enjoyment. Um, how many cards are there in a standard deck? 52. 52. Now, if you're playing poker or a lot of games, a lot of times you'll start out with five cards. Now, if you get the ace of spades first or the ace of spades last, does it really matter? No, it's still part of your hand, right? So these are the number of ways you can choose five cards out of a deck of 52. So five cards, you shuffle your deck. And by the way, just so you know, it takes on average seven shuffles to get a well-shuffled deck. So, um, <clears throat> so 52 choose five. Let's do that one on our calculator. No, let's do it back over here. Uh, let me clear this stuff out. So 52, choose five. Any suggestions of where I'm going to go to find that? Math. Math, good. Probability. Excellent. Probability. Number three. And number three this time. Well done, Jess. So 52 choose five. Should be about 2.6 million different ways to choose five cards out of a standard deck of 52. Whew. That's a lot. Two, five, nine, eight, nine, six, zero. Oh. Wow. So in poker, there's only four hands that represent a, a royal flush. So the odds of getting a royal flush are about one in 650,000. Um, you know, if you're just taking the first five cards that you're dealt. Cool. How about some other things that might be a little bit more interesting? State of Michigan has the Watto. There's 47 numbers. You have to match six of them. How many ways are there to choose 40 or six numbers out of 47? I'll do this one on Google Sheets. This can be much like what we did with permutations. What should my command start out with? Equal. Equals, thank you. Equals. And this time, I don't want a permutation, I want a combination. Oh, there you go, combin. What order should I type these in, separated by a comma? The large number first and the smaller number. Well done, 47 and then six. You can also get this number off your calculator, but it should be over 10 million different ways, different winning tickets or different possible ways to draw the winning ticket. I'll say that. Just for comparison's sake, your odds of getting struck by lightning are about one in 960,000. So you've got a better chance of getting struck by lightning than you do by getting struck by lotto. But hey, keep playing. That money goes to support your state's education fund. So it's safe to say that you don't gamble. Um, I regard it on a, as a tax on the mathematically challenged. So <laughs> actually, actually, I do gamble. Um, I'm just very careful how I gamble. But you're going to have to tune into my next video, section 5.1, to understand a little bit more about the careful choices that you want to make if you are going to gamble. Um, 
Yeah, because there's a lot of pitfalls. I mean, you got to understand that the odds are stacked against you from the get-go. I mean, if they weren't, Vegas wouldn't be able to afford its light bill. They wouldn't be able to afford to put up the high rollers and a nice suite and give them all kinds of luxuries because eventually, if you stay at that table long enough, you're going to lose money. The odds are just stacked against you. Probability is stacked against you. So, yeah, it's going to happen. But what you want to do is you want to do a lightning strike. You want to get in there, get lucky, then put some money in your pocket, and then play with house money. And then after a while, if you start losing some, walk away with money in your pocket. And never gamble with money you, can, you can't afford to lose. All right? Always go there realizing that you're paying for entertainment. And if you win, great. Okay. Um, let's do a couple more here. Try and highlight the difference. Now, I'm going to scratch something out, and I want you to do a couple calculations here, just a couple simple ones. Um, so let's suppose that we have um, four objects, and I'm just going to give them some very boring names, A, B, C, and D. Suppose you're going to choose two of them out of that four, and order doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter. That's for the first one. And the second one, you're going to choose two, but order does matter. Try and figure out how many ways there are to choose these in each case. And I'll let you decide what the notation is that goes here and here, and then do the calculations. You're not going to get really big numbers. But again, what I want to do is I want to emphasize what's going on here in terms of order matters and order doesn't matter. So give that a shot while I keep busy over here. Okay, so some help here. Somebody I haven't heard from yet this evening. Um, what notation am I going to use here? Is this a permutation or a combination? Combination. Combination. Thank you. It's a combination. And what did you get when you did four choose two? Should have got a number. Well. Six. Six. Should get six. So it should be four, choose Oops. two. Yeah, a number of ways you can choose two out of this. And here they are. I've listed them. So a way to do this, you know, to kind of cycle through this, I start out with A, and you can pair it with B, C, and D. Then I move over to B, and you can pair it with C and D. Then I move over to C, and you can pair it with D. So there's your six. But that's saying it doesn't matter what order you choose these in. That, okay, A and B is the same thing as B and A. But if order does matter, I can have A and B, but that's not the same as B and A. Or A and C, that's not the same as C and A. Or A and D, D and A and so on, B and C, C and B, B and D, and D and B, and finally, C and D, and D and C. And to kind of drive home this, this point of order matters, you're like, well, wait a minute, what do we mean the order matters? Well, let's think about it in terms of the presidential election. So on the Democratic side, you've got Biden-Harris. Would Harris Biden be the same thing? Mm, not really. Not if you're implying that the first one's president, and the second one's vice president. 
there, yeah, the order certainly makes a difference. And in some situations, the order is going to make a difference. So P choose um, P42, I mean, 4P2 is going to be 12. There's 12 different ways you can select these two out of here if the order matters. If the order doesn't matter, okay, then you only got six. So let's pay attention to whether the order matters here in the next couple examples. And we'll work on two different ones. Um, so let's go back to our handout. Are we okay with this one before I move back to our handout? Yep. Thank you. Um, so right here. A corporation must appoint a president, chief executive officer, chief operating officer, and chief financial officer. So you've got one, two, three, four different people that have to appoint. Um, you've got 13 qualified candidates and officers can also serve on a committee. So we're gonna start with this part first. You've gotta appoint these four people and you've got 13 qualified candidates. How many different ways can these officers be appointed? So the first and most important question you've got to answer for yourself goes back to something that I tried to emphasize a little bit earlier. Does order matter or does it not matter? Which one? If you're appointing president, CEO, COO, and CFO, does the order matter? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A vote for yes. A couple vote for yeses. Good. Thank you. Yeah, you bet your order matters. So you're going to be using a permutation. So um, permutation. And it's going to be this one. You've got 13 people. You're choosing four of them. And the order matters because if you're president or CFO, it's not the same as CFO and president. So the order matters. And it's surprisingly big. Permutations get really big really fast. So what number are you guys getting here? No one? Are you comfortable finding these numbers? Maybe you're just not feeling it. Brianna? 17,160. Perfect. 17,160. Thank you so much. Um, the big thing here is that order matters. That's the big thing with that one. Let's take a look at the next part. And let me do this. Can I... How many different ways can the committee be appointed? Can you still see my uh, OneNote file here? Yep. yep. Okay. Now for the committee, we want three people to serve on the committee. And that's it. There's no CFO, CEO, COO. It's just three people to serve on the committee. So the question is, You've got 13 people to choose from. You're going to pick three to serve on the committee. Does the order, yeah. Order does doesn't matter. matter. I've got an order doesn't matter. Do we agree with that? Yeah, it doesn't matter. I agree. It doesn't matter. All right, doesn't matter. So if it doesn't matter, what notation should I put in here? Should I put in a P or a C? A C. 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 You need a lot less candidates here, a lot less, uh, much smaller number here. So see if you can't figure out what 13 choose three is. 286. 286. Okay, so 286. All right. Um, are we okay with that? Yep. Yep. Okay, now there's kind of a follow-up question to that. 
Let me go down here. What's the probability of randomly selecting a committee or the committee members and getting the youngest three of the qualified candidates? Hmm. Well, how many different ways are there that we can appoint the committee? I'll give you a hint, we just calculated it. There's 286. So it'd be three out of 286? Great question. Would it be three out of 286? How many different groups of three are there that are the youngest group of three? Because that's what we're looking for. Yeah, there's only one group of three that's the youngest group of three. So the correct answer here would be one out of 286. All right. So there's one, one way out of 286 to get the youngest committee there. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me show you another, another kind of a curiosity about these, these numbers here. Why don't you calculate 13 choose 10? Someone want to tell me what you get when you do 13 choose 10? 286. 286. Yay. 286. Now that's odd. I got 286 over here. And what you can think of is that choosing the three you take also in the same way is like choosing the 10 that you didn't take. Taking these three means you're not taking these 10. So those two numbers are exactly the same. And you're going to see that kind of symmetry every time you work with um, combinations is that there is that symmetry. Choosing the ones here is like, you know, not choosing the other group. So if I did, for example, um, let's see, 11 choose seven. So I'm choosing the seven that I want. That would also equal 11 choose four. Choosing the seven that I want is like choosing the four that I leave off and vice versa. So just something to know. It's not something I'm going to test you on. So we're going to continue working with some of the stuff here. And in particular, um, I want to look at these problems here. Um, when nine basketball players are about to have a free throw competition, they often draw names out of a hat randomly to select the order in which they can shoot. What's the probability that they shoot free throws in alphabetical order, assuming each player has a different name? So, do you mind sharing your screen? Oh, am I not? All right, what's happening here? Where's um, mm -hmm. yeah, so let's share the screen. Ah. Yes, because when we come back out of a break, um, there we go. So let me go back to the problem then. Um, when nine basketball players are about to have a free throw competition, they often draw names out of the hat to randomly select the order in which they shoot. What's the probability that they shoot free throws in alphabetical order? Well, the first question you have to ask is, how many orders are there? Now, this is not going to be a permutation or a combination because you're not choosing some of these and not choosing the other ones. Basically, you're using all of them. So the question becomes, how many different orders are there for those nine players? And to calculate that, what do we need? It would be a factorial, right? Factorial, good. So it'd be nine factorial. But only one out of those nine factorial ways is the way to list them in alphabetical order. So the first question here has as its answer, one out of nine factorial, or I think we did that one earlier, that's one over 
362,880. Okay, let's move on to the next series of questions. Are we okay with that first one? Uh, a clinical test of, or a clinical test on humans of a new drug is normally done in three phases. Phase one is conducted with a relatively small number of healthy volunteers. For example, phase one tests of a specific drug involved only six subjects. Assume that we want to treat six healthy humans with this new drug, and we have eight suitable volunteers available. Complete parts A through C below. If the subjects are selected and treated in sequence so that the trial is discontinued if anyone displays adverse effects, how many different sequential arrangements are possible if six people are selected from the eight that are available? Choose the correct answer below. Well, it's not a factorial, right? Because in a factorial, you're not choosing some and not choosing the other ones. So it's not a factorial. It's either a combination or a permutation. So let's go back to what I've been emphasizing all along here. Does the order matter or doesn't it matter? It does. Dealing? It does matter. Absolutely it matters. So if it matters, then we're going to be calculating um, 8P6, 8P6, and there's a surprisingly large number that you get from this. What was that number? Does anyone want to share with me? 20,160. Nice. But suppose you're not going to do them in any particular order. You're just choosing six people, and that six people is your group, and you're gonna test everybody at the same time. So that's part B here. If six subjects are selected from the eight that are available, and these six subs, these six subjects are all treated at the same time, how many different treatment groups are possible? So we're not doing them in any order, you're just choosing six. How many different ways are there possible now? 28. 28. So six choose eight is 28. And by the way, what I mentioned earlier still holds eight choose two is also 28. So choosing the six you keep in is equivalent to choosing the two that you throw out you know, or vice versa. Nice. Um, mm. And last but not least, if six subjects are randomly selected and treated at the same time, what's the probability of selecting the youngest six subjects? So last but not least in this one, what's that last one there? Is it 28C1? No, not quite. Would it be we one, do out, wanna... one out of 28? Yeah, one out of 28. So basically one out of uh, eight choose six. So this is how many different ways we can get these groups. Only one of them represents the youngest. We okay uh, with that last one? I had a quick question. The example we did earlier with the three youngest, and it was just the one way. Oh, oh, never mind, I answered my own question. That's okay, yeah. Well, okay. let me go back to it anyways, because those three people represent one group of three. And that's why there's only a one here in the numerator, not three. That three people is one, is, is the youngest group. So that's a one there, not a three. So these are all the different groups of three. And there's only one group of three that's the youngest. Just like over here, there's only one group that's the youngest six. Does that answer your question? Yep. All right, cool. All right. That's all I got for this section. So enjoy.